and uh, I'll let him talk about your title. Everybody give a warm social media breakfast welcome to Spencer Smith. All right, so that's my Twitter handle, and also that's my Periscope handle, too. If you guys want to check me out on Periscope, I've had the privilege now of doing 125 Periscope broadcasts, which is a lot, because that technology has now been out for about three months, I think. So I'm kind of a Periscope junkie, and I know Mr. Don Stanley here is actually Periscoping this event live for me right now for all the people around the world that tune in on a daily basis when I do these things, but please feel free to check me out on either Twitter or Periscope at SpencerXS. And you guys, thank you so much. Everybody here at Social Media Breakfast, there's way too many people here to name that are very impactful with getting this thing pulled off. Because this is a lot of work. If you had told me back January 22nd of this year when I left a nice corporate VP job at a Fortune 100 company to start my own thing, that I'd be presenting at Social Media Breakfast in front of all of you today, that I probably know half of you personally, I would have told you you're nuts. But it's so cool seeing as how this thing sells out every single month, even when a knucklehead like me is here to present. So this really speaks to Social Media Breakfast and what they do. So thank you guys so much for having me. When I was asking Shane, Shane Cicero, who's on the board, what I should talk about, he said, what I'd like to have you do is actually create a workshop for people as opposed to just give a speech. And so that's why you see these sheets out on your table. This is something that I printed at home, which don't ever print stuff at home if you're going to print 200, because you go through like two or three black ink cartridges. <laughs> so on either side of this, there's a workshop that I want you to walk through with me. So one will walk through in person today, and that's what I call the Summerfest effect. And the other thing is what I want you to do when you get back to your office right away. Because what this is not is a motivational speech. Okay, this is something that you can take back to your office and use right away this morning. Now, how many of you have ever seen a motivational speech? Do you remember when the last time was that you saw one? I was thinking back, I think for me it was like middle school, right? And you remember that, like when everybody get brought into the auditorium because people were all going through their growing pains and the speaker would get on stage and say, the speaker would get on stage and say, all right, you're the jocks and you're the nerds and you're the mean girls as an homage to Nate Mall's presentation last time. And I want you to listen to my story because I want you all to get along. And you remember walking out of that auditorium and feeling pretty good, right? It's like somebody gave you a candy bar, and you were flipping down on a candy bar, you got the sugar rush, and you felt really great because you wanted to hug everybody. But what happened the next day, after you had this experience of the chocolate on your face playing the playground nicely, those are my kids, by the way. That, this is just a long story to get my kids involved. So. So you think about the next day you went to that school that you went to after, after the auditorium presentation, where you felt so good, and then you saw that nerd in the glasses again. And you kind of wanted to give him a swirly, right? So what I found is that motivation is fleeting. So I'm not here to motivate you, I'm here to give you stuff that you can use right away in your business. So that's what you'll know what to do based on what we'll talk about. And what we'll talk about is how to establish yourself as an expert without calling yourself one. Because that's always a slippery slope, isn't it? It's a very, very relative term. And if you call yourself one, what does that mean? Is it relative to the person to your right or to your left, relative to everybody? So what I'd propose is letting people call you expert. Let them bestow that title upon you based on the actions that you take, based on the actions that you present that are valuable. So I want you to earn this right, and I'll show you exactly how to do this. And I'll show you in two very, very different ways. One is an excuse to talk about my rock band that I used to be in. And the second is the same way I've been doing this now as both a writer and a speaker. So there are three steps to becoming known as an expert. The first is establishing reputability. The second is simplicity. And the third is accessibility. And so you might think to yourself, well, Spence, I don't have any expertise whatsoever. Did anybody feel that way? Good, awesome. Did you raise your hand, Jocelyn? Don't raise your hand back here, come on. Okay, so this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. So if, uh, and since Jocelyn was the only one who raised her hand, I'll have Mr. Emerson tell you otherwise, okay? One of my favorite quotes of all time, every man is my superior in some way in that I learn of him. So what does that mean to you? What does that quote mean to you? Anyone? Yeah. Everyone has Do you guys agree? 
Yeah, so look to your right, look to your left, look behind you. That person knows something. I like that, thank you. I like, somebody knows something that you don't and all it takes is extracting that out of them. But this isn't about other people, this is about you. Okay, so if we take this quote from Emerson and turn it on its head just a little bit, what does that mean? That means that every person can learn from you as well. And I'll show you exactly how to do that with this first step of reputability. This is what I call a credibility milestone. So think about a credibility milestone as being something that once you achieve it, no one can take it away from you. So maybe something for everybody in this room, once you have that college degree, that's it. It can never be taken away. Once you have that first article published in that first journal or newsletter or magazine or online publication or whatever, you will always have that thing. Once you win the Heisman Trophy, no one can, oh wait, okay. <laughs> At least not a Wisconsin guy can't have it taken away, right? Okay, so credibility milestone is that thing that you can accomplish that no one can ever take away. So you're setting a mile marker and you can only move forward from there. And so this is the key idea from our rock band that I want you to take away, and I'm gonna talk about this in quite a bit more detail. Don't try to create your own scene. Go to where one already exists and make yourself valuable. Don't try to create your own scene. So normally this is where I'd embed a video, but my presentation kept crashing because it's like 90 megs as it is. And Nate Maul's presentation last month was actually giving me anxiety seeing all those animated GIFs. I didn't say GIFs, Tom Buscheim, right? Yep, I didn't say GIFs. So animated GIFs, but just to give you an idea how addicting this stuff was when we played in our band, I actually queued it up here on Media Player so you can kind of see what it looks like. Normally there's sound, but this is our band um, February 9th of 2002 in Wausau, Wisconsin. That, that's me playing drums, it's about 400 people or so, so it was a packed room for that house. But once you experience that, you don't want to not experience that anymore. Because it's really awesome. And it's, it's kind of like playing sports, but you can't lose. Right, so you've heard, you know, people want to be a rock star, they want to live that rock star lifestyle, why? Because you can do whatever you want. And you're usually, unless you fall off the stage like Axl Rose, you're usually, which I, that's why I'm not standing up here, by the way, because I would definitely fall off the stage. <laughs> unless you fall off the stage, it's, it's not something that you can really foul up too badly. So we played there, as I showed you in that video, February 9th of 2002, that took us two years as a band to sell that many tickets at a show that was near us, because we had band members that were based throughout Madison. And we wanted to expedite that process. So we didn't want to go to each respective market and build it, because that's what we used to do, is you'd build your market in Madison. You ever been to a show and you see people handing out flyers and demo CDs and that kind of stuff, even though they're not playing? Well, that's what bands used to do, right? Try to get people interested in what they were doing. And you'd be really big in Wausau, and you'd go down to Stevens Point and no one would know who you are. And that's a really arduous way to do it, because we were trying to create our own scene by going to these respective areas. So we figured out, well, what if we could go to someplace else that already had an inherent crowd and had an inherent reputation that once we availed ourselves of that reputation by earning the right to be there, that we could then leverage that. So what's the world's largest music festival? Yeah, it's right here in Wisconsin. Right here in Milwaukee. And we knew that if we got to play at Summerfest, we could leverage that thing and use that as that credibility milestone to go elsewhere. So Summerfest has 700 bands that come through over 11 days on 11 stages. And so I called the Summerfest people. And I said, hey, who's in charge of the bands? And they're like, are you, are you joking? I go, no, no, there, there's gotta be somebody responsible for booking bands, right? Because I was just blindly naive, guys. Like when you're in a band, you just expect that people wanna hear you play. <laughs> and they said, well, it's one of these three people. So they put me through to Stacy, and she goes, hey, um, are you a manager? I go. No, I, I'm a drummer. She goes, okay, well, that's, that's something. She goes, well, do you, do you represent the artist? Are you an attorney? Are you an A&R person? I go, no, I'm just a guy in a band that wants to figure out how to play Summerfest. And she goes, really? You're calling me to ask how to play Summerfest? And I go, yeah. She goes, no one has ever done that before. <laughs> she said, people just kind of expect to play. They sign with a record label and they go, hey, wh when's our slot? She said, but because you asked me, I'm gonna help you through the stepwise process to figure out how you can actually play here. So this is what you have in front of you. 
is what I call the Summerfest Effects Pyramid. And I'll walk through this really briefly. This bottom step, join a band, because she and I walked through this. This bottom step, join a band, this is a lot harder than it sounds like. Have you guys ever been in a band before? Okay, how hard is it to get the drummer to show up? <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, hey Jeff, I'm a drummer too. But to have a guy who actually has his gear, shows up on time, shows up sober, I mean, it's, it's a lot of challenging things that has to happen within a band. So once you do the obligatory thing in the basement or your practice space or wherever it is that you get all your jitters out and get in front of a, a crowd, you first try to perform for that crowd. So that's the next step. And assuming you don't puke on your shoes, you want to do it again. Because we've seen bands do that. They play once and never again. Okay? A lot of bands, though, they stop here. They stop at this perform for a crowd. And you might say, well, wait a minute. Don't they go up and write a song? Or don't they write a song before they perform for a crowd? Not usually. Usually bands get out of the basement practice space, they play Beatles cover songs, or the Stones, or whatever, because it's safe. And a lot of bands make their living that way, is playing cover songs, because it's safe, you don't have to put yourself out there. And those are great gigs for those guys. I mean, they, they do really well. But in order to play at Summerfest, typically you have to keep going up the charts. So we wrote a song, we recorded a song, we released an album, a five song EP in February of 2000. And then after that point, we started selling tickets to our own show. Now, this is a huge demarcation that takes place because social media breakfast happens whether I'm here or not. Okay, so you guys are here probably not to see me, but you're here because social, breakfast, social media breakfast has an awesome reputation, right? But once you start selling tickets to your own show, it's a completely different story because people are there only to see you. You're not the default entertainment anymore. So after that point, after you sell tickets to a show, you know you can confidently go to the next step where you invite people from the press to come and review your live show, to review your album. And after that step, because we had done all of those things when I called Summerfest, she goes, you know what you're missing? You're missing a press kit. A press kit at that time, in 2002 when I called her, was basically a folder. It would have your demo CD inside of it. It'd have all of your press clippings that were relevant. It'd have reviews when you had them. And it have the obligatory 8x10 black and white artist photo. You guys have seen these in comedy clubs, right? So bands need these too, believe it or not. And there are really three elements to an awesome band photo. <laughs> the first thing is an element of danger. Because if you're a rocker, you've got to show that you're a rocker, okay? The second is you gotta have the guy who's in the band who looks like he's in a band. You can't just have four dudes and go, yeah, we're just dudes, right? But then lastly, and probably the most important part, you gotta have the guy who is really not very important in the band, but looks like he's important in the band. Typically the rhythm section, Jeff, okay? Bass player or drummer, and he'll try to take up as much space as is possible, have his arms crossed, you know, something to try to look relevant when he's pretty much not. So let's see if our band with our 8x10 black and white photo accomplished this. Yeah. So guess who the guy on the left is? Bass player. Two guys in the middle. Lead singer, guitarist. The guy on the right. Take up as much space as possible. You could just crop it pretty much right here and you'd still be good. That's me trying to look important. We are literally, by the way, standing on a railroad track. So there's impending doom. <laughs> so we hit all three elements of that. And when we showed this to the Summerfest people, they said, how could we not book you? That's not true. So they, they, liked, they liked the photo fine, but we had other stuff like this, like press releases, like Myopic Sun, which was our band's name, to perform at the showcase in front of record labels. Myopic Sun, the stage plot. Have you guys seen this before? This shows that you're legit. It shows that when you show up at a place, they go, oh, this is how we'll set you up. So you notice maybe in the video, I kind of had my back to the video, we'd set up so the drums would be stage left and I'd either be completely like this, set up sideways, or slightly off, like this. So it was pretty cool. It gave people a reason to listen to us. And then have you ever heard of the hospitality rider? This is where we really messed up. So the most famous one of all time probably is Van Halen. With what? What was their thing? Brown M&Ms, right? No brown M&Ms. Okay, so we had a reputation for being really nice guys that were super boring rockers. Because this is what we asked for. Two clean, safe 
double occupancy rooms. We had four dudes, so we're doubling up. We're, by default, we're doubling up. We're not even asking for four rooms. We wanted six hot meals or $60. We wanted dry towels, <laughs> bottled water, three bottles, this is the really hard one, three bottles of 32 ounce Riptide Rush Gatorade, <laughs> chilled if possible. <laughs> if not, no big deal, we'll take it anyway. An assorted meat and cheese tray, <laughs> I don't know what we were thinking, assorted vegetable tray, assorted fruit tray, and then stuff to actually eat it with. And at the very bottom it says, we'd like the option of making changes just so we don't have to waste food. So instead of doing Van Halen, instead of being Celine Dion, if you ever want to pull up her rider, it's like 50 pages and it's awesome. Don't do what we did, ask for more, okay? <laughs> so this is also part of our press kit at the time. So here ultimately is where we played at Summerfest. It's the northernmost stage. This was our first year, so it was one of those daytime gigs. This is the northernmost stage when they just rebuilt the Laser Rock stage. I don't even know what they call it anymore, but it used to be the Laser Mountain Dew Rock stage, and it was incredible. It was a dream come true for us. But we didn't stop there. We said, once we had this credibility milestone accomplished, what would we do next? So looking at that in the context of a pyramid like this, we had accomplished this big thing. We had been vetted by Summerfest. We could go elsewhere very, very easily and have people say, well, of course you're good enough to play here. You guys understand what I mean by this? All people want to do is feel good about booking your band. And so what did we do? We said, well, we hit the top of this pyramid and we want to go to adjacent pyramids, but the really cool thing about this is even if it's a disparate thing, you don't start at the bottom. You don't start at the bottom. You move laterally to the next pyramid and you usually end up somewhere in the middle or the top. So once you've been vetted by this thing, you can very easily move on to the next thing and not have to start over again. So here's a couple examples of how we've done that with our band. This is a visual representation of all of the stuff that people have to do when it comes to booking bands, okay? So there are 44 parts to this. And so when you think about this in the context of Summerfest, these people had 700 slots to fill. And so as I mentioned, all they really, really wanna do is check something off of their to-do list as done and feel good about booking you. Not put themselves out there, say, if they were vetted by this third party, of course they're good enough for us. So here's the example of how we did this. Purdue University, does anyone go to Purdue? Nice, S twice. <laughs> do, do tell. Okay, so Slater Hill, you know Slater Hill? Okay, so Slater Hill has what every year? Sledding, okay. Right? No, they don't have sledding. No, it says right there, no sledding. Okay, so what else do they have? <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> okay, so, so every year at Purdue, when they first start school in the fall, they have a big rock show. And this is called Slater Hill. This is called the Slater Slammer that they have every year. You can't really tell from this picture, but it seats 7,500 people. So it's a really big show. The year before we played there, it was Matchbox 20. So it's a, it's a big show. By the way, engineering-wise, Purdue is really cool because all of these columns here, they don't touch the roof. The roof is actually suspended from a ceiling, so there's no reverberation at all. So the acoustics on the hill and the acoustics inside are awesome. So what do we do with our Summerfest gig then? We went to Purdue and we said, hey, we have this great review from Summerfest. Here's a video. Would you let us play Slater Slammer? They said, sure. So we did. And that was it. You guys, like that's all they wanted to do. Well, we did have to go to a fraternity basement and audition. And that's a different story. But. <laughs> But that got us the audition to play there, and it was awesome. And then what did we do? Well, the thing that I want you to keep in mind after you perform really, really well in any capacity is ask for a review, a testimonial, a letter of recommendation, right that second. Have you ever been to a rock concert or any other concert, and as you're leaving, you walk by this table where they're selling overpriced CDs and T-shirts and everything? Yes? It's called the merch table. What they try to do is capture your enthusiasm at that time. They say, don't you feel good about watching the Rolling Stones? Here's a $70 t-shirt. So I want you to do that same thing whenever you perform is ask for a review right away. Because what happens when you ask for that review is people remember how they felt giving you that review like they were just there. 
So I'm going to zoom in on this, but this is something that goes out to all of the colleges. Because when we played at Purdue, we figured out this whole college thing was pretty sweet. They put you up, they pay you well, you have nice meals, you have an inherent crowd. So you ask any comedian, magician, band, if you could do a college band tour, would you? And they'd say, absolutely, because it's awesome. So this is a very, very detailed, back in the day before the, the web was really prevalent with this kind of stuff, this is a very detailed review of all of the band performances at every single college so people could reference it. So if you zoom in, what does it say? This is kind of like consumer reports. So in the upper left, you can't see this, but the key, it says outstanding, down to poor at the bottom. So if you have all O's, it's great. So Purdue gave us all O's. It says attendance 7,500. They're a tremendous act and extremely professional to work with. Because I asked right away to get that review. Had I waited, I might have not gotten it. So what did we do with this then? You guys see where I'm going with this thing? Once we get this thing accomplished, we leverage that next thing. This is what we did next. Anybody ever heard of this organization? Nice. What do you know about it, Andrew? Yeah, so basically a bunch of people with a lot of money and spots to fill and they're looking for a band to play, or a magician or a comedian. So I called these guys and I said, I know that you have these events that are akin to a, a trade show. Okay, so you have a booth as a band. By the way, the booth next to us, I kid you not, was Dustin Diamond, when he was a touring comedian. So things, we, we diverged from there. But, so we went to NACA and we asked them, we know that you're putting on this event in Grand Rapids. How could we do a showcase there. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, we have this Summerfest gig. We just played at Purdue. Here's a great review. Would you let us perform in front of 3,000 people for 15 minutes? We could hopefully get some gigs as a result. He said, well, yeah, we have two spots for bands. You've given us all the material required. You called ahead. You asked what we wanted. So we did. Here's the acceptance letter. I remember getting this because it had a little pink sticker. I still remember this. It had a pink sticker on it. It was kind of like a college acceptance thing. It said, showcase notification inside. Not showcase confirmation, showcase notification, so it kept the suspense up. So as a result of playing that showcase, we had, there's a picture of that showcase, which was awesome, like full lights, full sound, it was a blast for 15 minutes. We had this entire spreadsheet of gigs, just like that. Because we had done the Summerfest thing that gave us the opportunity to do Purdue, that gave us the opportunity to do this. Ohio State is on that list, don't hate me for it, they were just there, okay? So I have a problem with this quote. Have you guys ever heard this quote before, something akin to it? Stephen Covey says, if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. Have you heard something like that before? You see the ladder leaning up against the wrong wall? That's kind of depressing, isn't it? I don't think that's true. My friend Don Stanley knows about something from the Air Force called the 60 to 1 rule. Has anyone heard of this? Okay. I'm gonna have him just expand on this in a sec, if you could. So the 60 to one rule says that one degree off designated course equals 92 feet off of your target landing spot for every mile that you fly. So how many liberal arts majors in here? Okay, so this is what it actually means. Every 60 miles, you're one degree off, you're one mile off your target zone. So can you see that? Just one mile, one degree off, you're one mile off. So what that means to me though, is even if we're one degree off, that's giving us 60 chances as opposed to just sitting still. Don, tell us about the, the 60 to one rule, please. Well, the biggest, the biggest thing is you're essentially looking for feedback and, 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 and really whenever you're flying, is that uh, is always true is you're never 100% on course because wind, et cetera. So you're always looking for these little course corrections. And as long as you know the general direction you're moving and you're making those course corrections, um, you get the opportunity to get to where it is that you're intending to go. So I don't know if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> so why is what Don said really impactful? Right, you're exactly right. Thank you and good night. <laughs> so, no, but what he said is, is don't anticipate like you're gonna do everything perfectly. And like I said here, we have basically 60 chances as opposed to just sitting still that you're gonna end up closer to where it is that you wanna go. 
So even if you go to the wrong venue or the wrong magazine or the wrong client or whatever, it's still getting you closer to achieving that goal. So let's walk through this for two minutes. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to do this with me because this is a workshop, this is not a, not a speech. So what I want you to do amongst your table is think about that one thing, that if you had that credibility milestone, what it would mean to you individually, to establishing you as an expert and to your business. Just to give you a little help, this is where I am right now with my writing career. I wanna get in Forbes really bad, and I haven't been yet. So I figure the next logical step down is to get in Inc. Magazine. Those two are probably, honestly, interchangeable. But then, if you back up from there, from Forbes and Inc., Yahoo Small Business Advisor, Microsoft's MSN Money, Business to Community, Law Journal Newsletters, In Business Magazine, LinkedIn, writing on my own blog, the reason I'm asking you to do this is because I want you to establish that credibility milestone for yourself first, but also give yourself credit for the things that you've already accomplished. Because if I ask you to go from here to way over here, it's gonna be this chasm. And until you start breaking this down into a stepwise process and giving yourself credit for all the hard things that you've already done, you're not gonna be able to do this. Okay, so let's take two minutes, create something audacious that you wanna accomplish, and start writing the steps with the help of the people at your table, okay? All right, how's everybody doing? Does, hello. Does anybody wanna share what their audacious goal is? Anyone? Anyone wanna share their audacious goal? Yes, Jody. I wanna be a TEDx speaker. What, what's the step right before that? Uh, we were talking, so I haven't established it. <laughs> uh, have any ideas? <laughs> Speaking in Madison and working my way up that way. Anybody else want to share theirs? Any other TEDx aspires? Okay. All right, we want to get, uh, bring up my friend here, Barbara Boussard on uh, CNN. Uh, she's, she's working on an ebook right now about money management, especially for seniors. Uh, you know, she's going to um, have attorneys and, uh, and accountants calling and, and talking to her about this. She's going to eventually become a source at local newspapers like the Wisconsin State Journal. And from there, the sky's the limit. Once she becomes a local uh, source for media, uh, she will eventually climb the ladder to get to CNN. So you'll, you'll see her face there. <laughs> For those of you that know Barbara as well as I do, I, I think you know that that will happen. Yes? Okay, Anybody, any other sharers? Wanna go? Yes? Katie, you, you raise your hand. No? Okay. All right, so we'll move on. Okay, so here's the second step. Simplicity. How many people recognize this gentleman right here? Who can tell me who that is? Okay, what's Neil deGrasse Tyson famous for? Science, space, right. <laughs> Good answers. <laughs> he, he's not an astronomer. He's not a cosmetologist. He is a astrophysicist slash cosmologist, yes? Okay, so I'll get back to him in just a moment. What about this gentleman? Anybody recognize him at all? This is obscure. Okay, he died in 1930, so I didn't expect you to know him. This is Sakichi Toyota. And notice how he spelled his name. This was actually his original spelling of his name, but what he did when he established Toyota Industries is he found out that outside of Japan, Toyota was kind of hard to say. For whatever reason, it's not hard in English, but in other countries, it's hard to say in their language, so he changed his name to Toyota. So he was humble enough to change his name. What he created was something called the Five wise. Anyone heard of this? All right, you're going to love this. This is awesome. This vehicle won't start. This old Toyota won't start. Why? Battery's dead. Okay. Well, it's obviously a part issue. It's obviously broken. 
Well, what Mr. Toyota said is, no, 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 let, let's not be satisfied with asking that question once. Let's drill down to what the real core issue here is, why the battery died. And so if we ask why the battery's dead, is it's because the alternator isn't functioning. It's the thing that charges the battery. Well, why is the alternator not functioning? It's because the alternator belt broke. Okay, well, why is that? Well, it's because it wasn't replaced. The belt wasn't replaced when it was due. Why was the belt not replaced? It's because the vehicle wasn't properly maintained. Think about the most reliable cars that are out there. What names come to mind? Toyota, Honda, Nissan. They, they all share this amongst the Japanese. What they establish, guys, and this is really important, is that it's not a part issue. It's not a superficial issue. It's a behavior issue. What they figured out with their workers, the people who maintain their vehicles, their consumers, is that they weren't educating them enough. So the battery would fail and they go, oh, this Toyota is a piece of junk. But you know what? They weren't changing their behavior because people didn't even know they had to do that yet. So here's how we can apply that same idea of the five whys to Neil deGrasse Tyson because he right now is at the absolute height of his popularity and he's only going to get more popular. Like what other astrophysicist would you ever see being on Comedy Central? on multiple shows. He's just the default scientist that people bring on because he's so smart, he's so charismatic, but let's dig into why that is. And people might say, well, he's really famous now because he's on TV more and more. And we might just dismiss it, right? Like everybody on TV is famous, reality stars are famous, but he's more famous for a different reason. He's on TV more and more, why? Well, companies will pay a premium to advertise during his shows. So when the reboot of Cosmos on Fox came out, did anybody watch that? It was awesome, right? Samsung said, hey, th this is exactly our demographic. We will pay whatever it takes to be the sponsor on this reboot of Cosmos because Neil deGrasse Tyson is that guy that we want to be associated with. So why will companies pay a premium? It's because consumers have that same positive association with him. Well, why? It's because he makes them feel smarter. He doesn't say, here's a bunch of really hard stuff that you have no hope of understanding whatsoever. He goes, I'm going to help you walk away from this knowing something that you didn't know before. So why does he make people feel smarter? It's because he takes really, really hard stuff like astrophysics and makes it easy for all of us to understand. What I don't want you to do when it comes to establishing yourself as an expert is try to impress your peers because that's not our job. Our job is to help our people with whom we're trying to do business. Yes? Okay, so instead of impressing your peers, because this trophy, if you can't see it at the bottom, it says most complex, does not exist. Okay, no one gets a most complex trophy or ribbon what they get known for is things that they create that are really simple. So what is the most famous mathematical formula of all time? E equals mc squared. Do you suppose Einstein could have made it harder? He's Einstein, right? He could have added a few more things, but what he said is, I'm gonna strip away all the extraneous things because this is the truth in this equation. So. What Einstein did with e equals mc squared is he made things super simple so it would transcend him and his work so other people could use his work. Do you think people don't see Einstein as an expert as a result of making things simple? No, the opposite is true, right? If I can walk away knowing something that I didn't know before and it's that simple, I'm gonna give him all the credit in the world. Anybody recognize the other equation I have on here? Okay, what is it? Momentum, are you a rocket scientist? Okay, have you ever heard the expression, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, this isn't rocket science? Well, you know what is rocket science? P equals MV. So the next time somebody throws that out there and says, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, you can say, you know what is rocket science? P equals MV. You will absolutely blow their minds, you guys, because no one knows about momentum, which is just one of the core ideas behind rocket science. 
So I bet you didn't expect you're going to learn rocket science today, right? Okay. But what Newton did as well was broke it down to be very, very simple so other people could use it. So if these brilliant people broke things down into ultra complex, I'm sorry, ultra simple ideas, taking really complex ideas and making them ultra simple, wouldn't you want to do that same thing as well? And this is what Einstein said very succinctly, is everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's what you have on the other side of your sheet. So we won't take time now to do this, but when you run into that core issue that you're experiencing at your business, think to Mr. Toyota, think why Neil deGrasse Tyson is so famous, and then use the example that I put here on the sheet, which is the customer wants more time to think it over. And I broke down that example for you. Customer wants more time to think it over. Why? Well, the, the buyer is delaying her decision. Well, why is that? It's because she's not confident she'll be deciding correctly. She doesn't want to mess up. Well, why is that? It's because she doesn't feel like she has all of the information. Why? Because she doesn't know what questions to ask. Why? Well, it's because she hasn't been told what questions are even important that she should consider. Does that make sense? So use this, please, when it comes to that really hard problem that you don't know the solution to when you get back to your office, because this will help you dramatically. And here's the third portion of establishing yourself as an expert. After we build reputability, after we simplify, we create accessibility. And this is where social media empowers all of us to do these things like never before. What's the most famous painting of all time? Okay. Everybody agree, Mon Mona Lisa? Anybody else? Okay, who actually has seen the Mona Lisa? in person. Wow. I suppose we live in Madison, right? That's, that's a lot of people. That's a lot more than expected. Okay. So most famous painting of all time. What is the most famous farmer's market of all time? Duh. Right? <laughs> How many people have been to the Capitol Square Farmer's Market? Okay. So a few more than I've actually seen the Mona Lisa. Okay. So why is this important? I'm not asking you to become an expert in the world. I'm asking you to become an expert in your world. So the goal is not to be famous. The goal is to become valuable to the people with whom you're trying to do business, the people that you're targeting. And that's where accessibility is so ultra important because what can we do now that we couldn't do pre-web, pre-social media? With everyone, without any kind of detriment to you at all. If you share what you know, and I'm not asking you to share customer lists or your margins. I'm asking you to share all of those problems that you're solving because what's going to happen? People are going to look to you as a thought leader by default. It's not going to be to your detriment. People are going to laud you for doing these things. Who has actually heard of the 1% rule of the internet? No one? Okay, cool. I'm excited to introduce this to you. So what the 1% rule of the internet says is 90% of people online are just there to look. They're voyeurs. They read stuff, they watch stuff, and that's it. They consume. 9% of people like, share, comment, actually do things with that information. So we have the voyeurs, we have the people who share. What do you suppose the 1% is? The creators. So if you share what you know, you suddenly become this tiny minority of all of the people online. And here's the really cool thing, is something that's extremely boring and rote to you, someone out there is learning for the first time and you're going to be that person that teaches them. So who is the expert then to that person? You, because you are accessible. You're the one who's created that information. And this is the big thing, right? This is the impediment we all have to overcome. Content doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be you, it has to be genuine. Ask any millennial what company they wanna work for and they wanna work for a company that's authentic or genuine, not the biggest paycheck, yes? So this is prevalent. And the other thing, I, I know this wasn't going to be quite a motivational speech, but this is the one thing I want to have you keep in mind, 
is to create your art. Okay, not to assuage the concerns of other people, not to think about how it's gonna make you look, because you know what? There's so much content out there right now that yours is gonna get buried along with everybody else's, but the people who are looking for your content specifically are going to find it. And when you create your art, you're gonna be the one that gets the credit for that. So, to sum this up, to be seen as an expert by other people, to have them bestow that title upon you, what I want you to do is create your reputability in the marketplace by establishing those credibility milestones and using those as jumping off points to the next great thing. Second thing, simplicity. Think like Mr. Toyota with the five whys and say, how can I break this down to be even more simple so people can readily understand it? And the third, with the accessibility, think about your target audience and think about how you can be valuable to them. You want to get a hold of me? Twitter, at SpencerX says, or Periscope, at SpencerX says, and I also created a page on my site, spencerxsmith.com smb, that has these PDFs and the other resources that I mentioned on it.